name is uh, Jason J. Rock Houston, and you're listening to Chaotic Risk Magazine. We can be found on the web at www.chaoticrisk.com, and we're interviewing guitarist T.D. Clark from, for our new um, On the Record segment, and um, a lot of people have been making these lists, like top 10, top 20 albums of all time. They're like top 10 or 20 favorite albums, and you, you included T.D. on your list, uh, a classic uh, Def Leppard album, Pyromania, from 1983. And so why don't we start off the interview, if you don't mind, T.D., sharing with us how you first um, became a, a, a Def Leppard fan and how this album came on your radar? <clears throat> well, so when I first started playing guitar, like, I was probably 10, 11, 12, somewhere in there. Oh, wow. And it was the late, late 70s, early 80s. Um, and Def Leppard was one of those first bands where I remember sitting... It had to be about 1981, somewhere in there, when Odd Through the Night came out. Oh, yeah. Oh, and wow. we, were, we were all sitting around playing Wasted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And everybody played that riff because, like, well, we couldn't play much else. So everybody figured out that riff. So we all had bang in the room playing the same riff over and over. Mm -hmm. Probably driving our parents all freaking dead shit crazy. Yeah. And uh, so uh, it started there, and I was a huge fan of Odd Through the Night. You know, Hello. Oh, I love that and, track, uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, there's, you know, that album has got so many, so many good songs. And then, of course, the follow-up, you know, High and Dry, um, Mirror, Mirror, you know, and then, of course, all the hits bringing on the heartbreak and all these other things. Yeah. And then the re-release re 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 a piece I favored, Me and My Wine, that was another good one. Oh, yeah, wow. Well, me and My Wine, wow, I almost, I almost forgot about that song. That's such a classic, you know? Yeah, yeah. But, uh, so, Death Leopard, Pyromania. That was, like, one of those albums that's, like, there's probably, like, four or five albums as a youth that really just absolutely were just deal, just absolute deal makers, that breakers, deal makers. Like, Blackout from Scorpions, Dream yeah. of Revenge from Judas Priest, Death Leopard, Pyromania, and they all came out about the same time. Scorpions was probably, like, 82. Yeah. Yeah. Now let me and ask you. Yeah. Let me ask you because I was going to say. Let me ask you when those first two Def Leppards come out. Uh, the album, first two albums, High and Dry and um, and um, On Through a Night. Th those are almost full blown on metal albums. Whereas by the time oh, yeah. Pyromania comes around, it's quite a drastic difference in sound. I mean, it's still they still got a hard rock element, but it's it's more hard rock with a little bit of a pop element thrown in there, and not so much. Um, Metal. So when you heard the kind of new Def Leppard sound, what, what was your response when you heard it for the very first time? Well, I would say that even in the earlier Leopard records, it was probably more hard rock than necessarily metal, but there was probably yeah. a couple songs that were borderline in there. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I would say that Pyramid is still... It still was a, a rock record, and in certain aspects... A hard rock record, depending on track. But I think um, with Mutt Lang, you know, producer Mutt Lang had done Ace. High and Dry. Yeah. And for those out there who aren't familiar with Robert John Mutt Lang, he's, he has produced albums with sales reaching to like five or seven hundred million albums. That's what he did. ACDC Back in Black. He did ACDC for those about the rock. He did Heartbeat City from the Cars. Oh wow! He yeah. Did, he did a bunch of Elton John records. He did Def Leppard, Hysteria, Pyromania, yeah. Adrenalize. I mean, Mutt Lang has done like... Oh, he, he's I mean, a, I mean, he's kind of like the Bob Ezrin, you know, of, of hard rock. I mean, oh, yeah. I mean you he, know... He did Shania Twain and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he, uh, he, uh, he even married her for a few years um, before going to... He, he did her figuratively and literally. Yeah, so. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, it's amazing. And, you know, like, you bring up both Hysteria and, um, and, and Pyromania. And the interesting thing is, like you said, there, there are some artists who, you know, they got these landmark albums. And, and Def Leppard, like, right back to back, they had, they had two of those albums. And they're, they're very different albums, but at the same time, like, when most people think of Def Leppard, and you ask them what's their favorite album, the, the, their go-to albums are either Pyromania or Hysteria. And, and typically, um, people will lean more one way than the other but um but you know so that's kind of interesting right there but they had 
two kind of back-to-back -back albums that were just such landmarks. <clears throat> but I think, um, for me, when we're talking about rock and albums, like to me, mm -hmm. Pyromania, High and Dry, and Out Through the Night are one category of Death Leopard. Yeah. And the Hysteria, Adrenalize, uh, Slang, mm -hmm. um, and some of the other ones, to me that's a different, like, I was not a big Hysteria record fan. I mean, I bought the record, yeah. I think I saw the concert, I bought them live yeah. in the round. Yeah. And I liked some of the songs off Hysteria, but I felt that they had definitely, by that record, gotten away from their harder rock roots. Yeah. Well, like, um... were feeling yeah. Embracing pop. Yeah. Py know. Pyromania definitely is harder edge. I'll agree with you there. And I think yeah. by the time they got to Hysteria, of course, um, you know, after Rick Allen and the accident, they um, Pyromania, four years goes by, they, they haven't toured. Nobody, the band themselves are kind of having doubts like, are we able to, are we going to be able to come back? And they'd spent so much money on Hysteria. By the time they that, that album came out, you know, that's kind of, I think, the direction they went. They wanted, well, by then, you know, they had MTV, which was. It was around the Pyromania days, but it was just kind of really taking shape, you know. And all of a sudden, you know, when when Hysteria even first came out, it wasn't selling like they wanted it to. But with the release of like um, Pour Some Sugar on Me, it just it took off, you know. After that, <clears throat> yep. And that's an interesting story with Hysteria. They first were recording it with. Um, Oh, uh, uh, oh. Um, Glenn Ballard, I think, maybe? Oh, I think... They started recording with Glenn Ballard or somebody. I think it was, um... I think it was, um, the guy from Meatloaf, Jim Jim Steinman, the guy that produced, um... And he, he played in Meatloaf's band, too. And he, he played in, um... Uh, um, he wrote all the stuff with Meatloaf. And I think it was him, Jim it's Steinman. Was, yeah. yeah. They, they, I know they recorded the whole record with a different producer and got almost done and realized it wasn't what they wanted, so they scrapped the entire recording. Yeah, yeah. Started off over with Mutt Lang and to... <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. To break even on that record, I read that they had to sell 4 million units just to break even on that record. Yeah, and people fail to realize when Hysteria first came out, it wasn't the big seller, but it went on to... I mean, I remember when I first heard the song, you know, Women, I thought that, uh, yeah. it's, it's kind of a dud. But then but then you hear about other stuff, and it's like, like you said, the entire, you know, the entire album um, as a whole was just, um, you know, you just could not go wrong with it. But, but and, and getting back to Pyromania now, what most people may um, fail to realize, that's not Phil Collins... Phil Collins doesn't play a, a, a lick on that album because Pete Willis was actually still in the band. <clears throat> well, that's not entirely true. Phil Collins played all the lead guitar parts. Oh, he really? Didn't play the he, oh, yeah. He oh. didn't play the rhythms. Oh, okay. And he didn't write the songs. He oh. plays lead guitar on Photograph, Stage Fright. He, Pete Willis doesn't play any lead guitar on the album, but you are correct. He played the rhythm guitars and oh. co-wrote half the songs. Oh, that's that's interesting. Okay, I, I wasn't aware of that. Well, thanks for uh, educating me on that. But um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Phil Collins was brought in to play guitar solos because what was happening is Pete Willis apparently had a drinking problem. Yeah. And Steve Steve Clark, who by the way, whenever I saw the album covers with Steve Steve yeah. and Clark, it was always like he was so badass with his Les Paul, and it was like, dude, Steve Clark's such a badass. We were like, that dude's awesome. Yeah, I mean, so yeah. He was cutting mm -hmm. his solos and. They, uh, Pete Willis was not up to stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so, Phil Collins had been playing in the band Girl, and they, he knew the Def Leppard guy somehow. Yeah. yeah. And they said, can you come in the studio and, and put down some lead? Yeah, wow. And so he shows up, and uh, Phil walks in, and Mutt Lang puts him in there, and they just basically turn him loose. And so he ends up playing... Yeah. He plays lead guitar on, uh, I, I'll go track by track, because I was a huge Phil Collins fan, but oh. he played okay. Stage Fright, because one of my favorite Def Leppard leads. Wow, wow. And that's Phil Collins at his prime, like he's just going ape shit on that solo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's probably one of the coolest solos in a Def Leppard song if you listen to Stage Fright. And okay. it's like, and then he like blues like, and then he goes into this like groups of nine. It's like, mm -hmm. it's like so kick ass. And he's playing the neck pickup on his like mm -hmm. destroyer. It sounds so yeah. cool. But so Phil Collins comes out, that Leopard, and he definitely added some octane, but he didn't write any of those songs. 
Those songs were all written by Mutt Lang, Elliot, Savage, Allen, Pete Willis, and Clark. Wow, wow. Yeah. Uh, now, I, so, yeah. yeah. Now, I got to ask you, because you mentioned that you've been a Def Leppard fan since the very beginning, and you kind of just hit on this, which um, saying you're a huge um, Phil Collin fan. So, um, um, what, what, how would you compare him to the original guy, I guess, the guy that he stepped in for, uh, Pete Willis, as a player? I mean, so Pete Willis and Steve Clark kind of came from the same... Background. Um, they kind of the same players. They both were kind of this Jimmy Page... Um, blues, rock, um, I don't know how else to describe it, and Phil Collin was much more, they, they, they tried, they started categorizing, like, American players as being the ones all into the heavy techniques, yeah. like all the shredders, yeah. even though there's plenty of dudes who are not mm-hmm. American who play fast lines, um, yeah. But Phil Collin was more looked at as an American player because he, he played more like an L.D. Neal or something, lots of fast pick lines, you know, whereas mm-hmm. someone like Steve Clark was much more blues-oriented yeah. and much more in the range of a, a Jimmy Page or a Mick Ralphs or a, you know, I would say Gary Moore. Um, Gary Moore was kind of like a shredder, but he wasn't like a shredder in the sense of like a mom speed. Yeah, oh, yeah. He was all in on his own, you know, he was different. But, yeah, Phil Collin was like the complete, you know, he was a shredder for sure. Yes, you he, know, and yeah. uh, you could definitely tell his solos and everybody else's solos in the Def Leppard group, you could just hear them all. They were just totally different. Yeah, and it's, it's kind of interesting because, like, um, when I look at back at, like, Steve Clark, I mean, um, even looking at the music videos, or if you've ever seen the band on stage, him on the stage uh, with Def Leppard, I mean, he was a very visual guy. Like he, he moved, he moved all over the stage, and your eyes were kind of on him. He, you know, had the long hair and everything, and he, he just had all the right moves. And um, and then you, we put he, like, he was a total rock star, Steve Clark, and a great songwriter and everything else. Now I was gonna. That's my next point. I was gonna bring up about him. As great of a guitar player as Steve was, I think what what he really brought to the band. Um, was his songwriting, you know, ability. <clears throat> I mean, because oh, sure. if you look... Uh, very, uh, yeah, it's really no question about that. He, he came up with the riffs, like yeah. I was reading an article, and they were talking about all the riffs, and they said something about Steve Clark that was interesting, and they said, he very rarely came in with a whole song, yeah. but he would walk through the door with an armful of licks that would turn into songs. Yeah, and, and you can you can see how strong his songwriting was, especially on that um, Adrenalize album, which was the first album they put out after he died. Um, he, he co-wrote a lot of those songs on there, and yet and the interesting thing they they almost they were going to bring John Sykes in, but they decided, no, we're going to you know finish this off. Um, some, uh, Steve co-wrote some of these songs. We're just going to have Phil kind of do both parts, and he and I, I've heard him in an interview say it's kind of a really weird thing because I'm used to having Steve in the studio with me, and yet I'm in the studio. And it's like hearing the ghost. I'm I'm playing his parts and I'm playing mine. Yep. I was reading an article too. He's like, and when I was playing Clark's parts, he's like, I had to think how would Steve approach this song versus me? Yeah. What yeah. guitars and amps would he use? How would he approach the phrasing versus me? And I remember reading about that, and I remember also reading that Phil Cow was really wiped out because at that particular point. Tim and Steve Clark were totally like buddies and they were all drunk together all the time and I think that that was Phil had started cleaning himself up before Clark's passing but yeah. at one point they were getting so wasted all the time yeah yeah that's where that song comes from they were, yeah. they were total buds you know it's really a shame yeah yeah and, and in fact um that's why you like you were saying there's almost two different de- there's a uh, Def Leppard before hysteria and, and after and you know um like especially once steve clark is dead he's no longer in the gun he's in a band he's passed on um that's when um phil collin also became a lot more involved with the songwriting you know you know he did um but i think that so we're talking about steve clark and i, I also have to think that pete willis who oftentimes gets derided for a lot of reasons yeah yeah wrote a lot of those songs as well and I 
think that he oftentimes is overlooked because he, uh, from the article that I read, he came up with the main rip for photograph, Pete Willis. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I think that both Clark and Willis contributed a lot to the songwriting, and you can clearly tell once Willis left the band and you look at his stereo, yeah. there was a whole different bit of songwriting going on there. You still had some rock songs, yeah. like Women, and you had like Armageddon, it, which I guess is kind of a rock song, yeah. and um, whatever, but it definitely, the direction changed. And then when Steve Clark passed, I think it's like, part of the creativity thing kind of went mm. out the window. Yeah, so, yeah. Not, not in a bad way, that's unfair. I think in a different way. Yeah. You know, because I look at, I look at like Pyromania, you know, we're talking about that, so I don't have the track listing in front of me, but you got songs like Rock, Rock, Till You Drop. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, just a plain rock song. Rock of Ages. And I mean, then yeah. Rock of Ages, you know, huge, huge hit there. Foolin'. And then you had Foolin'. Then you had, what is it, Die Hard, The Hunter. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's... Yeah, Stage Fright. Um, I'm trying to think of the other one. Is it Billy's Got a Gun? Is that one on there, too? I think so, yeah. I think you're right, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, you had all those, you had all those hit songs. <laughs> And, um, and, yeah, you know, and then Photograph, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, as an interesting note, uh -huh. I, I was just talking about this with my girlfriend, uh -huh. and I said this before, of all the songs in the 80s, like, as a guitar player, uh -huh. I like a lot of different things as a player. Yeah. And I like all kinds of songs. I love these different styles. You know, I'm, I tend to be more in the shred thing. Uh -huh. You know, I like a lot of like heavy rock. But I have to honestly say that as far as the 80s go, I think my favorite song of all time from the 80s is Photograph. And I went on record saying that before, and I said that years ago too. And I have literally in the 80s, there's thousands of songs that I love. Yeah, yeah. But I have to tell you that I think Photograph, every time that song comes on the, on the radio or if I'm listening to F, uh, XM or I'm watching YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and then I play out in a cover band. You know, uh, I play with my solo band. And then I play in a cover band on the weekends and stuff too to make money. Yeah. And we play it in there. And I'm telling you, I get chills every time we play that damn song. Every time I hear that song. And I'm just convinced. That's probably my favorite song from the '80s out of every '80s song. Yeah, I mean, it's just an all great. The riff's great. Everything about the song is great. It's an upbeat. It, it you know, it's it's good time music. And um, you know, people fail to realize, you know, while we're talking about Def Leppard, um, this album came out in 1983. That was a time, like I said. Um, you know, if you were a Def Leppard fan before and you followed the band from the very beginning on through the night and all that. Um, you know, um, there was a time where MTV wasn't around. I mean, um, music television, what is that these days? But um, back then, you, you know, when the first two Def Leppard albums came out, you might not know what the band looked like, but then you see them on MTV. And let's, for, let's uh, remind people, this is a time when you could still go to a record store. You didn't have to order everything online. You know, um, you could pick up Circus Magazine and you'd see what the band looked like. Um, back in those days, you know, people actually put out a record, so... They had an excuse to go on tour. It's kind of done the other way now, these days, you know? <clears throat> yep. And here's an interesting little factoid, too. So there's a couple factoids. So one of them is, um, the song Photograph actually was released in 1982. Okay. Uh, and late 82, the single was released. And I don't think the record came out until February or March or something of 83. That sounds right, but yeah. But the single... The single already came out, and the single was already, like, number one forever. Yeah, yeah. And um, long before the record came out, and then the record was dropped, right? Yeah. These days, you know how it works. The single's out there, and these days, everybody just hijacks the music, so they're stealing all the MP3s. In this case, you had to wait for the physical record to come out, and it was massively hyped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And here's another factoid. That album, Pyromania, is one of the few albums in history, and I think there's only a handful, uh, there might only be two mm -hmm. or three, that got diamond sales status but were never number one. Oh, wow, wow, wow. 
Because Pyromania came out at the same time as Michael Jackson's Thriller. Yeah, yeah. And that's... Michael Jackson's Thriller was number one on the charts for damn near forever. I was in high school. I probably, what was I, in 82? I was a freshman in 80? Okay. I graduated in 85. So 81, 82, I was a freshman. 82, 83, I was a sophomore. 83, 84, I was a junior. 84, 85. So I was like a sophomore maybe I guess somewhere okay. in there okay. um, but that record was huge and they were all over on TV and it's interesting that you bring up how you can now see your guys everybody I was just t- it's so funny I was just talking to my girlfriend the other day that I wanted to buy a uh, Phil Collin um, Destroyer three pickup and I had looked at them years ago wow. I looked at buying one last year and the cover band I'm in and I was like, yeah, because I have a guitar endorsement deals with ESP, and they usually just give me guitars. Mm-hmm. And I probably sound like everybody in the audience is going like, this dude getting three guitars, but they do. So because of that, I'm hesitant to ever buy guitars because I literally have 20 guitars, and ESP has given me so many wow, because wow. they're a golf company. Yeah. So I'm hard-pressed to go buy guitars, really. Mm. I mean, that's the honest to God truth. Like, every time I go to buy a guitar, I go, why would I buy a guitar? Because I can usually either get it free wow. or it cost it for something custom. So why would I spend the money? But yeah. I was looking literally at spending the money to get a Phil Collin Destroyer. Oh, wow, that's cool. Uh, wow, how, how awesome is that now? I'm still thinking about it. Yeah, you yeah. Know, I'm still yeah. thinking about it, you know, except for, I gotta tell you, this whole COVID thing drove the price of everything up because when I was looking at Phil Collin Destroyers like two years ago, a year <laughs> and a half ago, they were like, 1300 now 2800 2500 2200 yeah oh wow you know and, and, and talk again a little off subject for a minute you know talking about this covid 19 stuff i mean what's that been like for you as a, a guy that does a, your own original music and you know uh, uh, doing the live thing is very important but um not being able to get out there and play live that's um you know that's a big way you make your money these days yeah um so i got divorced in 2012 Wow. And I was running an after-school lesson company, Mars Jazz. We run after-school music programs for kids. And I taught and I played out stuff. But um, music, as you know, is very difficult to make a, a, a living. steady living at. You can make good money, but it doesn't seem to be steady. Even like the music programs, you know, they would slow down in summer. Yeah. Um, even with park district programs, at one point I was in like 14, 15 school districts covering hundreds of schools, and we were in like 50. 60 park districts in Illinois. Um, but it was just very, very difficult. So several years ago, about three and a half, four years ago, I got into another side business that was outside of music for the first time, pretty oh. much on purpose. Yeah. So I'm a little diversified. Yeah. And so the COVID, the COVID has definitely hurt because I can't play out, I can't teach my after school program, yeah. I can't teach, and I still did all those things. But fortunately, this toolbox company I started called Rock and Toolboxes. Oh, wow. It's rockandtoolboxes.com. Yeah. That thing has taken over the vast majority of my income. I started it with zero dollars, uh-huh. uh, no seed money. I just started it with a Facebook page. Yeah. A wow. Facebook page and a dream. Wow. And, uh, That's amazing. The first year, I did over a half million in sales, and the second year, we were over a million dollars in sales. Oh well, you know you've kind of you've kind of done it the reverse, but that's that's great because you have your day job that you know where you're you're making the bulk of the money, and then you can still do the music thing on the side. Well, and I run the company. I own it, so pretty much like for today, I was working from home. Uh-huh. I was sitting there practicing guitar while I was entering in orders and doing the Facebook stuff and cool. taking phone yeah. calls, and um, so I was doing all day while I was sitting there noodling on guitar. I'm working on a vocal record right now. Oh, cool. That's my first little vocal record in forever. And how's that coming along? Because, again, most people know UTD as a, you know, simply an instrumental uh, music type of guy. So um, have you sung before? Or is this something you're kind of like, I want to see, you know, how this um, is taken by the fans? Well, my second record, Personalities, had four, four vocal songs on it. And I thought they were good songs. I had some singers come yeah. in. And, um... And one of the main reasons that I was always instrumental, if this is going to sound funny, but I was in bands that had vocalists up till about 94, 95. Makes sense, yeah. And that's when I put and, you know, and we can never get anywhere. Yeah. And I was writing what I felt were good songs. Yeah. And I thought, I, you know, I was practicing guitar like crazy. I was trying to be the best player I could yeah. be. I was trying to write the best songs I could write. And, um... 
we couldn't get anywhere because of the singers, generally speaking. Yeah. And so, um, I then put out my first instrumental guitar record in 95, 96. You know, talking about striking while the iron's ice cold, you yeah, know. Yeah, pretty yeah. much the whole strength thing had come and gone. Wow. And here I'm putting this record out. Well, sure enough, I got picked up by Steven Zweiss. He's a famous music attorney, represented Led Zeppelin, Jimi Hendrix, oh, Richie wow. Black, Mark Jimmy Page. Great connection there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's huge. Yeah, if you guys don't know who Steven Zweiss is, go read about him. He was the lawyer who got Jimi Hendrix the advance to build Electric Lady Lamp Studios. Yeah. He handled all Led Zeppelin stuff. He did Bad Company. Oh, wow. He did uh, all these people. Richie Blackmore, when Jimmy Page went solo, Jimmy Page. And so I got Virginia uh, interest, or interest from Virginia my Japan with my first instrumental record uh, before anything happened. Oh, wow. And Weiss represented me and put me on tour. Wow. That's amazing. So, yeah, it was crazy. You know, and I remember having a phone conversation with him. Yeah. He called me on the phone, and you got to remember back then the internet really wasn't around. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, I, I wasn't totally certain who he was, but I mean, I knew enough. They had warned me who he was. That warned me, but they had told me, you know, this guy's a huge, powerful, wealthy attorney. And, you know, I was, I think I was 26 or 27 when I met him. Oh, wow. And, you know, I was, I was relatively young. Yeah. And um, he called me up and... You know, I was kind of surprised that he would want to represent me because she was telling me about all the guitar players. You're talking Mick Browse and Richie Blackmore. I can't say it enough. Jimi Hendrix. Wow. Jimmy Page. All these guys who he was representing. And you're like, you, you've heard I of me? Yeah. <laughs> wow. I couldn't figure out why he wanted to represent me. I, I just was like, whatever. And you, you know, he was telling me he loved my record, my first record. Oh, there you go. <laughs> he was listening to uh, the song Metallic Hoedown, and there's a part at the end of Metallic Hoedown where I do this pretty fast run. Uh -huh. I mean, you know, I mean, by, by shredded standards, I think it's probably pretty standard, but it's a pretty fast run, and I remember Weiss on the phone going like, that's one of the fastest guitar solos I ever heard in my whole life. He's wow, like, that wow. was so good. Yeah. And uh, I was just sitting there just amazed that this guy would even be interested in so. Anyhow, he uh, he put me on a tour in 1996 with Ted Nugent and the Bad Company. We did 26 dates doing arenas and stuff. And then my career kind of took off from there. We didn't get picked up for a deal. Um, I could have had a deal in Japan if I wanted, but Weiss told me it was a bad idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, Weiss had told me, like, my record was already done and it sounded great and it was selling well. And the record company wanted to basically have me re-record the record. So they could own the masters oh, and wow. then re-release the records. Uh, and Weiss kept saying, he goes, if you want to do that deal, he goes, you're going to need another attorney. He goes, because that's a horrible deal. He goes, you're better off not getting signed yeah, than doing that. He goes, I offered him a deal to license your record. He goes, you would make a lot of money. Uh, he goes, and you would control the record. And he goes, and from my estimation, he goes, the record sounds great. There's no reason for you to redo it. He, Weiss said... If the record didn't sound sonically right, he goes, I would tell you to do it. He's like, but your record sounds fine. He goes, this is just a money grab. Oh, wow, wow. <laughs> Good guy to have you on your side, huh? Wow. Yeah, you know, I mean, but at the same time, you know, I was 20, at this time, 27, 28, mm -hmm. and I wanted a record deal. I wanted to tour the world. He's like, I'm not going to sign you to a deal you're going to regret forever, and then you're going to blame me. He's like, there's no way yeah. to get someone else to do that. Yeah, you, you, you know, know, yeah, and, and I was going to ask you, TD, how do you feel about fans going on, you know, internet like YouTube and that, and and downloading your music and stuff for free? I mean, because you know, I ask because um, a lot of people get ripped off that way. <clears throat> oh, there's nothing worse than I go on BitTorrent and sign my albums, uh -huh. you know, and you know, people are downloading it, and all these people are like, oh, this is a great album, this is a great album, this is a great, it's like, well, if it's so great, why don't you pay for it? I hear you, and the reason I bring it up is, that, you know, I was doing one of these interviews with somebody the other day, and they're talking about their favorite, um, favorite Jimi Hendrix album, which was Axis Bold Love, and, the, and interesting enough, um, I discovered, if you go online, and you try to go on YouTube, and, um, and you put in, like, Jimi Hendrix, um, none of Hend half of Hendrix's stuff won't even come up, and if anything comes up, under the name Jimi Hendrix, it's like um, it's people that have done covers songs, you know his, and and I thought that that's one of the few artists um, that they they got I guess control the catalog, which is I guess a good thing. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, the 
know, the state of the industry is such that I had to get into selling toolboxes. Wow. You know, like, I've got two kids, and, um, you know, I'm going to be putting them through college soon. Yeah. And I love playing music, and I still get to go play music. I was just in L.A. at the Whiskey A Go-Go last year with Michael Schenker Group for wow. a bunch of dates, and then we were here, and then, yeah. you know, I still get to go out and party and be a rocker when I have to, but... You know, I got kids, I just bought a new house, you know, and uh, really, you know, I bought a new town home with a full basement. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, my daughter lives with me full time now. Wow. And so, you know, I love playing music, but like with the COVID, if I was doing what I did before, I would be ruined. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Thank, yeah. You know, I'd just absolutely be screwed really bad. And so mm -hmm. um, I'm glad that I diversified and, and part of mm -hmm. people stealing records you know, and not paying for it mm. and stuff, you know. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, and it's almost interesting, you know, circling back to Pyromania, when you think about these records, yeah. can you imagine if Pyromania came out at a time where everybody just downloads it for free? Oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. First off, the record probably never would have reached the heights that it was. Yeah. Number one. And number two, the genius that went into making that record Mutt Lang and, yeah. the, and the six guys, you know, Pete Willis, Steve Clark, Rick Savage, Rick Allen, Joe Elliott, and Phil Collin, even though Phil didn't write it, but he did cut a lot of the yeah, solos yeah. on the big song. You know, none of them would have got their just desserts here. Oh, yeah. You know, even like Pete Willis, you know, he'll, I'll read articles and yeah. you know, he'll bitch about whatever being kicked out or they'll talk about it from time to time. But yeah. the reality is, is that, you know, Pyromania sold 10 million units and he co-wrote the song. So he has to be making in residuals, even now. Oh, yeah. From song plays and licensing, I bet you Pete Willis is still bringing home a half million dollars a year. And the funny thing is, like you're saying, um, he'll never have to... He'll never have to have another hit again. He'll never have to work another day in his life. And, and yet at the same time, it's kind of hilarious because um, when most people think of Def Leppard, a lot, a lot of people discovering the band these days, they think of Phil Collin as a lead guitar player. They know nothing about Steve Clark or nothing about Pete Willis, you know. And, it's, and a lot of people think of Def Leppard. Oh yeah, Vivian Campbell, Phil, um, Phil Collin. But I think um, I even think people kind of um, accepted Vivian um, when Steve died because Vivian kind of knows his place. He never tried to come in and you know out, out, outshine Steve or anything. He just did what does what he does. <clears throat> with Vivian Campbell my solo band supported Last in Line which is basically Dio without yeah. Dio because yeah. he passed away yeah yeah and we did a show with him here at the Arcata Theater in Illinois and it was like sold out like a thousand people or whatever wow. it is 800 people yeah and um, we were talking to Vivian after the show and it was really good seeing him doing the Dio stuff because he's a he's a monster lead guitar player yeah and, and as you said, in Def Leppard, he's completely accepted his role to just basically do the Steve Clark stuff and just kind of take a back seat to Phil Collins. But he doesn't seem to mind. Like, he's got the total right attitude. You know, he goes out, he does last in line, he shreds yeah. out, he does his thing. And, um, you know, I mean, I think he's totally, he's got the total right attitude. He's like, you know, he's a Hall of Fame, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee. Yeah. You know, I think... I think he's actually been with Def Leppard longer than Steve Clark or Pete Willis, for that matter. Oh, oh yeah, and, and yeah, and you know the interesting thing about Vivian, he, um, I don't know if you know on the Slang album, he, um, which was his first album where he actually played with the band on a CD, um, he had a track where he called "Work It Out," which he wrote and does a lead vocal, kind of an interesting track. But um, you know, again, he knows his place. He got the, he did all the stuff. And like I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the new lead singer of Def Leppard. He knows his place, you know. And um, it, is, it is what it is. But like you said, what, what a great side gig that is. I mean, um, that's kind of his main main gig. It pays the bills. He's able to do his thing. He's able to have last in line on the side, you know. So it, it all works out for everybody. Oh, yeah, you know. And it's interesting, too, you know, as we keep, we, you know, we keep bringing up Pyromania, Rock, Jeff Leppard as just a cornerstone, you know. When, when bands like Jeff Leppard I mean, you know, I hate to say it, but when bands like Def Leppard, Bon Jovi, Aerosmith, mm -hmm. um, when they stop touring, 
that's going to be a really interesting time. Yeah. Because the people are not making music like that anymore. And maybe for good reason. Maybe the younger generation doesn't want it. Yeah. But it's, it's an interesting thing because I go back to my youth and I just say, you know, I listened to that Pyromania first. I think I had it on record. Yeah. And then I bought it on, I think, cassette, right? Because yeah, yeah, CDs right. weren't really coming out too much then. I had it on cassette. And I just remember playing that, yeah. playing that, playing that record. I mean, it's just, you know, you listen to some of the Rock of Ages, yeah. Photograph, Fooling. <laughs> You know, rock, rock till you drop. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, all that stuff. But uh, oh, it's just, it's just great guitar work, great records, and you know what? One of the coolest visuals of that band was them doing the videos because Phil Collins had his Destroyer and his polka dot shirt, and then Steve Clark was playing his Les Paul, but he had a polka dot handkerchief, I think, around his neck, if I remember correctly. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> It just amazing. And it was just, it was just an awesome, cool thing, you know. And that, like I told you, that Ibanez Destroyer, man, that thing has been swirling around in my brain forever. I'm definitely gonna buy one at some point. There's no question. And, and, and you know, Def, Le Def Leppard, they're just. Um, I think what makes them so successful is they're a tight bunch of guys, you know, like like brothers. It's, it was like when Rick Allen lost his arm. I remember Joe Ellis saying, "We weren't gonna be ones to tell him he was out of the band. We were gonna let him make the decision, you know." And um, stuff like that has happened over years, and then. When Vivian was battling his cancer, he, he was out, out there touring the band, had a bald head at the time, but whatever. You know, um, they're like, you know, just be just be yourself, and and that's why I think the fans love Def Leppard so much. But more than anything, they're just they're great songs. If you didn't have the songs, the fans wouldn't be there forty years later. You know. Yeah, and I think you're right. Like Def Leppard, I think because of the fact, like you, if you ever look at the records, everybody's involved in the writing, and even they're not. Everybody seems to be involved in everything. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing, is that they split the songwriting, I mean, that's what that's what Queen used to do, and then that's when Queen started having problems, where they all of a sudden wanted to each write their own, you know, hit songs and stuff, and, um, but I think that's what keeps Def Leppard together, they do everything kind of, um, you know, together. Yeah, well, I think the bands that still have the original members in them, yeah. for the most part, are the ones that share the songwriting, because, <laughs> you know, if you write... If, if, if you're writing as a band, yeah. then there's going to be enough money in it for everybody to stick together. Yeah. You know, the money is a big, you know, money is a big, I don't know how you call it, but it's a big... It's a big... Um, this business. People don't like to talk about money, and, you know, you hear people say things, they're a sellout, they're, he's a sellout, she's a sellout, you know. Nobody got into business to be broke and starving. Let's be honest. Yeah. Let's be completely freaking honest. Yeah. Nobody. Nobody says, I'm going to play guitar and struggle the rest of my life. Yeah. But hell no. They all say, I want to play guitar and hookers and booze and limos and Learjets and play in front of 100,000 people and make you $100 million. Mm. So, in the situations where everybody writes, everybody shares in all the royalties a lot more even than where there's only two guys writing, yeah, and then yeah. they salary the rest of the guys in the band, and then you have guys in the band making two hundred grand a year, which is great money. But when the other two guys in the band are making twenty million a year, yeah. it starts showing the descent. Then it's kind of like you know, um, <laughs> Motley Crue, Nikki Six, and Mick Mars write most of the tunes, and the other two guys. Um, you know, um, they, they're not as involved in the songwriting, but like Nikki and Mick, um, you know, they're set for life. I mean, think of all, every time a Motley Crue song is played somewhere, they're, they're making bank, you know? And, um, you know, it's kind of like, I remember interviewing Frankie Benelli, the Quiet, uh, Quiet Right drummer, a couple years back, and he was telling me, you know, those, those, that Quiet Right record was such a hit. We did those two Slade songs, but and he said we had number one album, but you know what? Quiet Right got the fame. And Slade got all the money. And Slade at that point had been a band that, band, a little band from England that they were they were pretty big in England, but they didn't really do too well anywhere else. By by the time those Quiet Right songs came out, I mean, like they were making bank for the rest of their life. They never had to tour again, you know. <laughs> uh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, and that's the problem when you're the song. Yeah. Like with songs, the stuff. Like, if you are not the writer, you're really not making much, man. And that that's always been the case. And yeah, I, I did a 
show at Frankie Benelli not too long ago in Quiet Riot. Yeah. And the only thing, I think, the only way to make Frankie makes any money off the deal is he, I'm pretty sure he owns the name and stuff. So when they go play, oh, yeah. he not only gets a portion to play, but he gets a chunk of the name. So yeah. if Quiet Riot, the band, generates a million dollars a year, yeah. He owns a per, he owns the majority percentage of the thing, so I think he gets a big chunk. I think. Oh yeah, that's that's I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Because um, next to Kevin Debro, he's been the one in the band the longest, and obviously Kevin's no longer here. But um, you know, getting back to Def Leppard, just to, to kind of touch on what we're talking about here, the money aspect of it. You know, a couple of years back, Def Leppard re-released all their music, like so people can get it digitally. They 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 own. And I think in order to do that. Uh, part of the reason they did that so they could own all the rights to their music and, and I think a lot of that stuff had to be re-recorded like you were saying and so um, so, so, so if you're listening to um, you know Rock Rock Till You Drop or any of that stuff um, that unless you own like the original CD and you're, you're downloading it digitally these days that may not be an original recording uh, for, for most people's you know information there <clears throat> well that goes back to trying to control everything hold yeah. on one second yeah yeah Sure, sure, go ahead. I, I, I actually have a little more time. This is just... Perfect. Um, yeah. So, um, what the heck was I just saying? Are we talking about how Jeff Leppard, you know, recently, a couple of years back, they re-recorded oh, a lot of their music? Because, yeah. <laughs> well, the record company, like, people, a lot of people aren't familiar with how record deals mm -hmm. work, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit here, but the way a record deal works is this. The record company gives you money to record an album of your songs. Now, you own the rights to your songs unless you sign them away. Yeah, yeah. But the record company owns the master recordings, which means they control how many pressings, when they do the pressings. They also make the most of the money because they own the master reels. Yeah. These days, nobody does tape really anymore. It's the master recording. Mm -hmm. but back in the day, it was the master reels. And so... The money is in owning that, because if you own that, you can print that record forever. And if you own the rights to that, you can print and print and print and print and print. Mm -hmm. And back in the day, the bands would sign a record deal, and a standard deal was, you do the record, you get a dollar ninety nine cents every time a record sells, the band gets a dollar, uh, the record company gets like six bucks, and then the rest of it is made up with who was ever the reseller. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you might have a record that sold 10 million units, and the band, even though with sales, there, if you hit certain tiers, a lot of times they would build in, if you hit 3 million yeah. units, you'll start getting a dollar thirty-seven a copy, if you hit 5 million units, you yeah. might start getting a dollar seventy-eight. but yeah. the band's never made all that much money because the master reels were owned by the recording company. Yeah. And because of that, if the, tomorrow, if the record company decided it wasn't going to release the Leopard Records anymore, yeah. well, they would be screwed because they don't control the master reels. So yeah. a lot of bands have been going back, re-recording the songs, because then they control those master recordings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Now, the, as the writers, you still own it, and you still get paid from it. So yeah. the people who own the songs publishing house or the writer themselves yeah. they're still making money yeah but it's like an asset right like the master reels for Def Leppard I think they're owned by uh, Universal maybe. yeah yeah I'm trying to think of that. so the master reels for like Pyromania and Hysteria are probably owned by Universal those reels are worth a hundred million dollars yeah because those records will sell in perpetuity forever yeah I, I've been I've been recently read some on the internet where a lot of artists, I think, um, for example, um, the Masters I heard or some for Guns N' Roses, Appetite for Destruction, um, they got extra copies. They're not as good. They were some of them were recently like burned in a warehouse fire or something. So I mean that that's another set of event of things that could take place, you know. Oh yeah. Well, and here's another thing. Um, like Elton John, he spent a lot of his own money to buy his reels back. Yeah. So he didn't record it, but he bought it back. Well, the record company know how much they're worth so they charge you out the ass to buy the records back and people have been doing that there's no question yeah yeah Molly crew talks about how they bought their master recordings back <laughs> no one's ever certain how he was able to do it yeah 56 figured out how to do it he doesn't talk about it yeah <laughs> smart and man the woman who worked for the record label she gave him back <laughs> i don't 
you know, I don't know if Nikki Six had to fuck that woman, excuse my language, yeah. I don't know what the deal with the devil he made to get his masters back. Yeah. But he did it. I don't know how to this day how he did it. Because he did it at a time when it was really unheard of. Yeah, and, and, and maybe that's something on her, who knows. But, um, you know, I, I think the most classic um, example of what we're talking about here is um, there's, there was a classic rock band called uh, Creedence Clearwater Revival. The, the singer, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yep. John, John Fogarty, um, he had such a bad record deal that once the, even once the band broke up and he went solo and everything, it got so bad between him and his record that the guy that owned the label was making more money than he was off of his own songs that he, for like 10 years... He wouldn't play any of those songs and, and until after the guy died and he was able to get the rights to the songs back. But it just um, a, a, another case of where record company making more money than the artist. Just very shameful. <laughs> well, and Fogarty's deal is worse. Yeah. Not only did he sign away the master recordings, but he sold away the rights to the song. Yeah. So when they broke up and he did just solo John Fogarty, yeah. his record company sued him. Claiming he ripped off his own song. Yeah, I he heard that's music. amazing. Yeah. It's yeah. the most ridiculous thing. It's like suing Bon Jovi because his song sounded like Bon Jovi. It's like, well, in fact, he wrote him now or 20 yeah. years ago. It's still going to kind of sound like Bon Jovi. In, that, in fact, I, I remember seeing this thing years ago on uh, John Fogarty. I think it was on VH1. I think it was a show <laughs> called Legends. And he, he was talking about how he had to actually get up in the courtroom with his guitar on the stand and play the, and play the song to prove, no, I wrote that. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah, it's like crazy. Yeah. I got another Death Leopard anecdote for you. Uh -huh. So, I was married to a woman from Spain for about 10, 12 years, and we went to the Spanish Canary Islands. They're off the coast of North Africa. Okay. Off of Western Sahara and Morocco. And um, they're like huge, like, uh, resort places. Yeah, yeah. A lot of Europeans, Germans, Russians, British... They all go there for vacation. Okay. Supercon. Yeah. And um, so I went in. They had a place called the Harley Rock, ah. which was kind of like a ripoff of the Hard Rock. Yeah. And uh, I walked in, and I was the only American, I think, on the island. We were on Lanzarote, was wow. the island. Wow. There's like five islands. I'm trying to think. There's like Gran Canaria, Tenerife, yeah. Fuerteventura, and Lanzarote. I think there's a fifth one. But anyway. So I walk into this place, and um, there's a band playing. Okay. And I start, I start talking to him, and it's a band playing, whatever. And the guy starts telling me, this guy at the time, this was a long time ago, yeah, probably yeah, 10 yeah. years ago, but yeah. at the time, he played there, and they played five or six nights a week. And I forget what he told me he got paid, but he actually got paid good money. Like, I want to say he got like... 300 euros a night. Wow, wow. So that would have been like, say, 15 to 1800 dollars or 1800 euros, which back then was a little more than dollars, probably about $2,000. Yeah. But I had to play like six nights a week, though, I'm pretty certain. Oh, wow. But anyway, so they would do covers, and, you know, the place was packed with tourists. Well, he starts telling me that some of the guys from Def Leppard own houses on the island wow. and they would fly down there and do writing sessions and party and then they would come to the Harley Rock and sit in and he was saying that like Joe Elliott came and sat in one night and sang a bunch of songs and wow. Wow. The, like the guys would come in and play and I thought that that was so crazy um, so that's something to look up Death Leopard guys owning houses in the Canary Islands I don't oh. know if they do anymore but the guys wow. were on it back then well, and before we wrap this up today, TD, I got to ask you, how disappointed were you to learn that um, that summer tour they're going to go on with Motley Crue and and Joan Jett and Poison has been canceled? You know, this whole thing that's going on with music, yeah. I feel like the music business can't catch a break. Yeah. The musicians in particular, I shouldn't say the music business, they've been ripping people off forever, but the musicians, because look at it this way, first... Their, their lives are controlled by the record companies. Right? Right, yeah, when yeah. they finally get freedom from the record companies, everybody yeah. steals their music. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So then the only way that they can make any money is by going on the road, and then that's taken away. Yeah. And it's just, it's a lot to take 
Because I know a lot of musicians who, just up until three, four years ago, all I was doing was music. Yeah. And I know these guys are hurting, and I just look at the business, and I just say to myself, mm -hmm. is live music ever going to recover? Yeah, and, and you know, I, I, I understand, not to get into politics, but I understand, you know, um, this COVID-19 is serious business and stuff, and people have been getting sick, but at the same time, you know, they, they've had us locked down, like, for, at least where I live, like, for three months. I live in L.A., uh, you know, I live in L.A. County, and, and believe it or not, um, they're like, well, we, we don't know, um, we may be locked down for a little longer, maybe a year before we let live concert events come back, and, and yet, at the same time, they're having people writing and stuff. And that's that's perfectly all right. You know, a few few weeks ago they were they were threatening to arrest people for going to the beach here, but um, but you can get out and riot because you have a right to protest. I mean, it's just crazy, you know, when you look at those two well, spectrums, you know. And going back to LA, <laughs> yeah. I don't even know how they can utter such a thing of we're not going to have live music, considering that the town was built on live music. Yeah. What are what? I mean, you're going to drive the music business out of California. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it is. Yeah, I mean, let's be honest. It's uh, expensive to live in L.A. to begin with. A lot of those yeah. guys that used to, you know, uh, live here, move into Vegas, move into Nashville. I mean, Las Vegas they call Music City. I mean, that, that's how ridiculous it is. But you, you got some of these politicians, they just, I mean, they, they like having a little bit of control, but they let it go too far because, I mean, um, it's just crazy. <laughs> Yeah. Like I said, we just played two sold out shows with Michael Schenker. Yeah. He did three nights, we flew out, did two of them. And it's packed every night, and they still yeah. love rock, right? But, yeah. But if they keep doing this stuff with not having live music, it's going to move. Like, I, you know, in Chicago, we have a scene, but it's not really an original music scene. When right. I go to LA, I play with my solo band. Yeah. We do all my original music. Here in Chicago, there's certain venues where I'm doing support slots with yeah. nationals pretty regularly. Yeah. I do my original band. But there's no, absolutely no market for original bands in the clubs. you got to play yeah. covers if you want to make money. Yeah, well, I'll tell you how you pathetic know? it is here. You know, um, the whiskey's still in business, but, you know, they keep going to this rate. They may go under as well, but I, I've seen recently where the Troubadour, they're, they're going under. They, they may have to close. They, it's gotten so bad, they got a GoFundMe page. Um, and if it keeps going this rate, you know, all the clubs may end up going under. Just very sad state of affairs. Yeah, it's brutal, you know, and as much as I like bagging on politicians as yeah. much as the yeah. next guy, yeah. I I often wonder, when you look at the top down, yeah. from the president on down, the amount of mixed signals and mixed information yeah. and conflicting information, yeah. I think just made it very, very difficult for anybody to make any sane, oh, yeah. any sane yeah. decisions. I I, I mean, the, the thing I will say they all have in common is this. Okay, like, um, I'm lucky in the sense that I've been out of work for three months, but where I work, I can work from home. They're continuing to pay me. So I don't have it as bad as some people. But at the same time, um, what about all these people that aren't, aren't as fortunate? And you got these politicians deciding when people get to work, who's essential, who's not. They're still getting paid. No matter how much the rest of us are out of work, if, if it's another year or whatever, they don't care. They're getting a nice fat paycheck. And the governor out here in California, you know what? He's telling people, I think we're going to be locked down at least till July or August. He opened up the wine country. You know why? He owns a winery up there. I mean, just how does that look, you know? <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you what. Yeah. I agree with you. I, you know, I, uh, I don't know. You know, it's just such a mess. And I don't know. Speaking of that, though, I have my first live gig of summer a week from Saturday. Yeah, let's talk about that. <laughs> yeah, we're doing a, we're doing a gig at a place called the Broken Oar mm -hmm. in Port Barrington, Illinois. It's on the river. It's on the Fox River, and so this place is famous for having outdoor shows all summer. Oh People wow! People roll up on their boats, make yeah. dock, and come in and drink and eat yeah. food. It's a biker bar. Everybody brings out their Harleys, their cool bikes, any motorcycles, whatever Hondas. Yeah, they bring them all out. And the place is a party all summer, and it hasn't been able to open until this past weekend. Uh. And so we got a gig with Poison Crew, uh, uh, my 80s tribute band. We do everything from Poison, Miley Crew, uh, White Snake, Night Ranger, wow. Billy Idol, wow. Rat, Skid Row, um, you name it, we cover. Oh, that's cool, that's and, cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, we, we, we 
actually one of the top draws. You know, we consistently draw between like three and five hundred people when we're playing. Like, oh so wow, wow. We do, we do really well, and uh, this is our first gig of summer. A lot of our gigs were canceled, and even my solo band we had several yeah. events canceled. So yeah, let's, I was fortunate right, uh, be, yeah. right before the lockdown. I was in Puerto Rico on vacation, and I flew home on a Friday, and the very next day we yeah. supported y and at the Arcata Theater in front of like 8,900 people. Oh, wow, wow, that's amazing. Hey, let me ask you, T-Dick, um, as far as the cover band, um, how do you go about, like, do you have a set list of songs or bands that you guys kind of um, cover, or is it kind of just, um, what, like, you pick a set list, or how does that work? We probably know 150 songs or something, and then we just rotate through them. I mean, you know, oh. we... We do Quiet Riot, Full of Boys, we do oh, cool. uh, Chicks, yeah. we do Y&T, we do Summertime Girls. Oh, that's a good one. We mix up, of course, you gotta do the Bon Jovi yeah. ones, you know, and, you know, I, I you know, yeah. have to do, you know, pour some sugar on me, I hate that song, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. Um, but we do do Photograph, you know, we do Rats, yeah. and we do like, you know, I'm trying to think of all the different songs we do. We do so many. We do oh, that's, 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 yeah, I just want to get an idea, but that's that's cool. And, you know, um, to kind of wrap this up before we do, I just wanted to tell, kind of share with you, um, you know, in, in uh, regards to playing out live, um, a lot of people are trying to find new ways to do it. Um, I've seen recently online where Gary Hoey, of all people, I think he's doing it in Europe or somewhere, um, going to be doing some kind of performance like at a, at a drive-in theater. <laughs> So that that's pretty that's yeah, pretty cool, um, and then but I guess doing that here in Illinois as well. Oh wow wow! And um, talking about you know Phil Collins kind of um, your guitar hero in that, um, I was curious, what did you think of his little like um, kind of uh, talking part in the song "Make Love Like a Man"? Well, <laughs> you have a little rap or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Well, that particular song, I'll be honest. Uh, Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple. I love my Def Leppard, but there's a couple songs where I'm like, what the hell were you thinking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh. but, uh, yeah. And, but, uh, um, oh, yeah, for the listeners out there, if you want to download music of mine. Yeah, sure. Uh, if you would if you wouldn't mind supporting it, I have five records on TV Clark uh -huh. on iTunes, and you can get it on CD Baby. Uh -huh. I think it might be on Amazon. Okay. And then you can look up on Facebook, T.D. Clark. I got all kinds of videos and stuff. And then tdclark.com for all the listeners. And people and can then, follow you on Facebook as well, uh, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, look at Brian T.D. Clark on Facebook. And I have all of my latest stuff on there. My solo band, T.D. Clark fans. And uh, we do lots and lots of some national support. That's like the main thing we do now. It's like... The Clark Band only plays out maybe 10 times a year, but it's always doing national support. And then Poison the Crew, we probably play out 50 times a year, 60 times a year. Oh, wow, that's and fun. It's all, yeah, oh. we play out a lot. And we have a really good time, man. I mean, that's when good. I first got the covers, I won't lie. Yeah. I really thought I was slumming. I went from playing tours and playing all over the world, and I'm home and I'm playing, like, you know, Bon Jovi songs. Yeah, at least you're, still, I realized, you're still doing it, man. Okay. Some aren't, you know. <laughs> Well, you know what? Yeah. I realize that there's no shame in anything. People are going to work and do whatever they got to do. And if I got to go play Motley Crue songs, which I'm not a huge fan of, yeah. you know, uh, then that's what you got to do. And I really kind of grew into having a good time. And, you know, the number one thing that changed my mind uh. was watching the amount of joy on people's faces. And we're talking yeah. kids from young kids yeah. when we do outdoor and family events to 20-somethings, to 30-somethings, to 40-somethings, to 50-somethings and older. Yeah. Looking at the joy on these people's faces from coming to one of our shows really showed me that what I was doing was something good, you know, and important. And granted, I never get all crazy. It's a cover band. I try not to get too crazy about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it does have a positive effect on people. It gives them a way to escape their reality. I call it... And I really like yeah. it. I call it rock and roll theater. I mean, that's really what it is. But it's it's all it's all done in fun, you know, in love for the music. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, again, and I, I think part of me was yeah. being really kind of uh, I don't know if you want to call it a music snob, but I was like, I just came off all these tours, and now I have to play covers. And I think I was kind of being snobbish about it, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It wasn't being fair to the music, and I was being kind of a 
I don't think I was being very fair yeah. to a lot of stuff. And I'm telling you, I've now been in Poison Creek now probably seven years. Wow, and wow. I've never had all that much fun. Wow, we that's... Play yeah, because I... Casinos, yeah. We just showed with Vince Neal, wow. Michaels as a cover band. Wow. Not to mention my solo band, but the cover band, we play with everybody. Wow, you know, that that's, that's a lot of fun. And, and I will say this, you know... Um, for most of my life, I haven't been like a diehard Mick Mars fan or anything, but, but when you learn of the disease a guy suffers from and that him and Nicky write all the songs and, you know, um, they do what they do on stage, um, and especially the fact that Mick Mars is not really much of a, he's not really a rock player like people think. He, he, he comes more from the blues, but, you know, Molly Crew is where he makes his living, so that's what he does. Yeah. And he talks about how he was into slide guitar and blues guitar. And, yeah. This is this an agent. It's like you said, you know, people do what they got to do to pay the bills. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm just not shaming that, man. Like, oh, no, no. Honestly, we make good money in Poison Crew, and yeah. it's a lot better than going out and, you know, swinging a pickaxe. Or oh, yeah, or yeah. Truck, you know, any day of the week, I'm thankful that I have that opportunity where before... I was scoffing that opportunity when I should have been looking at it different, and that's why I'm yeah. saying the past seven years in Point Court, that's so much damn fun, yeah. and I'm so thankful for every opportunity that Soul Band gets, that Poison Crew gets. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm just very thankful I can still get out and do it and stuff, you know, and, and, and I'd like to say, too, yeah. I like being a dad. Oh, cool. and I've been very dedicated to my kids. Yeah, yeah. One of the big reasons people ask me all the time, they'll say, you know, I was playing with Dee Snyder for a while, yeah. and I was playing with Chris Medina from American Idol, and people will say to me, well, why didn't you ever just take off and tour the world and all these things? And I, I think, honestly, yeah, I don't think I ever wanted to leave my kids. Like, I think I've enjoyed going out and working with superstars, but being able to come home and drive kids to soccer. Yeah, because, you, know, you know, because, you know, even, even playing on stage with Dee Snyder, there's not a whole, it's only a truckload of people that can say that. So, I mean, I mean, that that's, that's it right there, you know. Uh, you live, you're living the dream, and, and to just kind of... Yeah, I, mean, I, played, I don't know if you knew that I played on his record in 2016, We Are The Ones. Oh, wow, I wasn't even aware of that. I got that album, cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I played on that record, a really good record, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, it's like people will say, how come I didn't do more? And the question yeah. really is, is I've done tons, yeah. but I was able to do it and still be there for my kids. And I know that sounds a little strange, but it's important to bring that up because... My kids mean a lot to me, and the music business is hard yeah. on relationships with kids or whatever. Yeah. And that's something I really tried hard. You know, that's probably why I started playing in the cover band, too. I realized if I was going to go out on the road, I was going to be gone 48 weeks a year. Yeah. And uh, I didn't want to leave my kids, man. My well, good, kids good. Done as a kid, and well, I never wanted yeah. that to happen. I wanted to be there for my kids. Well, good good for you. And, you know, just to kind of uh, cap off the interview, TD, I'd want to thank you again once for uh, again taking time to talk to me. It's been a lot of fun talking to you. And, you, you know, we're talking specifically, um, kind of all over the place, but we're talking specifically about Pyromania and, and um, what, what a great album that was. And Def Leppard is an artist, i got to say. They're one of those bands that they've really got this song so much that I, I remember seeing them on tour a couple of years ago and they did that tour of Motley Crue. We had two great headlining sets from two great bands. But I'll tell you, especially Def Leppard, I enjoyed so much to the point that um, there was not, they did not have one song in the set that I did not enjoy. It was like listening to the soundtrack of my life, if you will. That's how good the, the concert was, you know? Honestly, God, Def Leppard's like an ear ice cream shop. They got a flavor for every <laughs> yeah. part of your ears. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They, they do not disappoint. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, um, could you hold on for a minute, TK? Okay, because I just want to ask you one more thing. Take care.